what Jeff said? No, when I put in my earbuds, I, I turned the uh, the computer off accidentally. Oh, <laughs> so there you go. It. There you go. All right, so welcome. I've got two of them. <laughs> to what? Oh, no, no he, now it's only one. Okay. Oh, oh, there you go. There you go. All right, so welcome. To what? Okay, I had to shut the chat off because I was echoing myself. So forget it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, not so much of a smooth start to the very first uh, Wine Writers Write Up, but thank you everybody for joining. And um, my concept here is just to get a whole bunch of us together and just talk about some topic of wine and uh, obviously to all drink together. Um, so we're gonna start off with introduction of our panel. And the first up is Jeff Eccles. He is a certified specialist of wine through the Society of Wine Educators. He is a blogger and the host of an award-winning podcast, We Like Drinking, that I do not miss a week of. <laughs> These guys rock, and I love them. And just for you guys, smoked whale testicles. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me on. It's uh it's awesome to be here. I'm I'm ready to drink. There we go. There we go. Next up is Rick Dean, and he is a wedding photographer by day and a wine blogger by night. He focuses on wine, food, and food in Charleston, South Carolina, and the experiences there. And he enjoys learning about wine and sharing his perspective. Hey everybody. It's, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I started drinking a while ago so that I could be nice and ready for, for this, so look, looking forward to it. Awesome. And uh, Nick, I think you're muted. I don't know if that's on your end or my end, but I have a little mute mic next to your name. Uh, next up is John of Tappuccino's. Vino, and he is an online wine real retailer, and him and his wife Irene founded it, and they specialize in importing and distributing wine from Europe and interesting wine regions in the U.S. The focus is on small family-owned producers with a dedication to making top-quality handcrafted wine. Hello. Hey, everybody. It's actually great to but uh, actually real faces to, to names. I've seen everyone's picture and on Instagram and everybody looks completely different. Um, uh, live and better, by the way, much better. Um, and, and many of the people on this, um, on this um, Google Hangout have actually bought one from us, so thank you. Um, and I hope when you guys taste it, you enjoy it. Awesome. And uh, well, I hope I look different and better since my picture <laughs> is of uh, Draco. <laughs> <laughs> Your snout quite isn't quite as long as your your picture on Instagram, <laughs> and I'm not quite as gray. I'm not quite exactly. As gray. <laughs> uh, next up is my Fresno buddy Nick, and he is a marketing and brand manager for two wineries in the Pacific Northwest. He began his career in wine down in Argentina, where he did marketing communications for a well-known Malbec producer. He holds an advanced uh, certificate in wine and spirits from the wine and spirit, oh, WSET. I now learned how I'm supposed to say that. WSET. He's yeah. currently in the diploma class, um, which, whew, good luck. Whew. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and Nick, what, Nick? He is super awesome. handsome and awesome. Right. <laughs> I didn't write that part, right? No, that's all me. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and well, thanks for having me. Go ahead. What do you? Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. And Debbie G. Aquindo, the Hudson Valley wine goddess, is a certified wine specialist and wine location specialist in Port and Champagne. She has a background in travel, radio marketing, and community relations. She is also the author of Tapping the Hudson Valley, chairperson of the Hudson Valley Wine and Spirits Competition, which she graciously allows me to judge every year. 
and she is a co-owner of Happy Bitch Wines and my co-host on Wine for Bet Street, which is a free monthly wine education program. Thank you for uh, having me here tonight. I'm looking forward to drinking with all of you. Yeah, it's been a long time since I drank with you, Deb. <laughs> I know, 24 hours. <laughs> 24 hours. <laughs> And if you are listening to this, I'm assuming you kind of already know who I am, but I am Lori and my husband and I, uh, my husband Michael and I own a boutique winery in Paso Robles. We specialize in producing award-winning Cabernet Franc. We are the founders of Cab Franc Day. And in addition to my microbiology background, I am a graduate in the UC Davis winemaking program. Woo -woo. Woo. So, Thank you everybody for joining and I am so happy to be here with you guys and appreciative that you are taking your Monday evening um, or afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in, to be with us and to share your thoughts. Um, first off, all right, what's everybody drinking? <laughs> the most important thing. Debbie, you're all the way to the left in my camera, so you go first. Okay, so I've got... Kundi Sauvignon Blanc. Nice. Love it, love it. I call this my house wine because it's just easy drinking. It's Magnolia, it's, uh, Magnolia Lane, 2016, and I always keep their stocked in my house for company, especially a company that doesn't drink red wine. That's the first thing that I pull out. Awesome. Jeff? Yeah, so, you know, you got to have bubbles in my opinion. Uh, and, uh, so I like, you know, if, if I'm looking for something for every day or for something I can pull out anytime, I like to go under 20 bucks if I'm talking about bubbles. And so for, for me, there's nothing better than a little Grue uh, out of New Mexico. Uh, they do a, a fantastic, uh, uh, traditional method. And, uh, I just think they hit it on hitting it on all cylinders all the time. That's awesome. Now I'm not going to lie. I have never heard of them. Um, Debbie oh, was really? like, I have. So I'm going to have to really good. I have to keep an eye out on them. My kind of go-to uh, bubbles is Chateau Saint Michel. Um, mm. They're you know, it's 13 bucks. You can't you can't go wrong with 13 bucks, and and it's always solid. It's always good, and. I can savor the living daylights out of it. <laughs> the, the Gruette is typically around 17 or 18, probably depending on where you're at, but it's a great bubble. Yep. Yeah. About and 17. They're, so, they're, they're from France too. So yeah. So Gru Gruet and Fee, if, do we want to talk about it now or do you want to walk? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Gruet and Fee is the French. Uh, they're, they're actually in France. And um, geez, if I can remember his name, uh, Gilbert, uh, was the founder of it. He came over to the United States like in the fifties, uh, I think. And he found that there was other uh, Europeans making it, growing grapes down in New Mexico. And he had always wanted to do something over here. And so in 1984, uh, they started uh, some plantings in, in uh, New Mexico. Uh, he sent his two of his kids over and said, you guys are going to go make wine. They do primarily, uh, it's usually a 70% Chardonnay, 75% Chardonnay, 25% uh, Pinot Noir. So kind of a classic uh, blend. Their first release was 1989, uh, consistently 90 points wine spectator. They've been in the top 100 uh, a couple times, I think. Oh, I've been a, under a rock. What's that? I said, I've been living under a rock. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think in, uh, sometime in the nineties, I think they sold a million bottles, uh, in a year or something like that. I mean, you should be able to find this just about anywhere. Um, they do a rosé, they do a demi sec, they do a grand reserve, they do a grand brute rosé reserve. Uh, and they've got a Sauvage, uh, brand that's a uh, no, do no dosage, uh, uh, completely dry as well as they do. So, wow. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look them up. I, that, seriously, under a rock, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> All right, John, what you got? I am drinking lint tea today. Uh, nice. So this is um, uh, you know, we we live really close, maybe an hour 
from Wente, an hour and a half on a, a bad driving day. And uh, I've never been to Livermore. I shouldn't say that. I've been to Livermore 3,000 times. I've never had wine uh, in Livermore. Um, so that's our next conquest. Um, we went to Lodi for the first time a few weeks ago, and my snobby Napa Valley uh, attitude was eroded very quickly. We met some amazing wines and winemakers there. And, and I, so I want to get down to Livermore. So I, I pulled some Wente out of my uh, cellar that a friend of mine had given me, and it's it's drinking really nicely. It's really, really balanced, and um, it's not super restrained, but it's not super Napa Cabbie either. It doesn't jump out of the glass. I think it's just a great drinking uh, Cabernet. I'm, I don't have any food with me right now, and it's it doesn't feel overpowering. So I'm really impressed with it, and and it's again price wise, it's about a third of the price of a of an average Napa Cab. Um, so really impressive. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're solid. They they, you know, you're getting good stuff with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Nick. So, my kind of go-to, what I always keep in my cellar, would be it's kind of like cheating. <laughs> um, but it's Malbec Terroir, so it is their line just above their Classico. So it's about nineteen ninety-nine. Um, and I keep it there, well, one, because it holds a special place in my heart, but also I love to taste people on it and see if they can guess what it is. And not a single person has ever guessed that it's Malbec. Um, it's, you know, grown up in the Valle de Uco, so really high uh, elevation, super fresh. You're not gonna get that super extracted, um, you know, jammy, flabby, what people think of when they're drinking um, grocery store, you know, Malbec. So it's uh, it's really kind of a, a treat, but, you know, I stock up every time that it's available on the West Coast, which is rare. And what does that, what does that cost about? Nineteen ninety nine. Under 20 bucks seems to be the Under hit. 20. Mine's fourteen ninety five or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, under 20 seems to be to be it. And I think it's kind of funny because Mike and I, when we first started getting into wine, like 20 bucks, we, you know, like we stood there and, you know, argued with each other. Should we, shouldn't we, should we, shouldn't we? Now, <laughs> yeah. you know, now, now we're, you know, 20 bucks. Yeah, give me whatever, you know. I'll bucks. take three. Why not? <laughs> it's a bargain. <laughs> right. What's another 20? Yeah. Right. All right, Rick, what do you got? Well, I am drinking our my go-to, which is a Gilheim. It's a French from Languedoc Rosé. This is the 2017 vintage. It just landed a few weeks ago. And because I live in the South here in Charleston, we really drink Rosé 12 months out of the year. And... I had the fortunate opportunity to go to this winery when I was in Languedoc a couple of years ago, and I fell in love with it. It's fresh, and it goes with every season here in Charleston. Yeah, I like areas that are rosé all year. That's and it only, it's ten ninety nine. Oh, that's yeah, great. Ten ninety nine, a real bargain. I saw it for sale in Massachusetts, and it was twelve ninety nine. So I mean, it's going to be below fifteen pretty much anywhere you go. That's good. That's good. That's real. That's real nice. Yeah. Um, so my go to um, for people who who know me are probably going to keel over in shock that the bottle I'm going to lift up is not the bottle that they're probably thinking I'm going to lift up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Drum so, roll, please. So my go-to wine is Pine Ridge Chenin Blanc and Viognier. Good stuff. And yeah, that is a nice little bottle of wine. It is. It, it is a great <laughs> wine. You know, I always have it on hand. I always serve it um, when people come over. Uh, you know, get them in the door. Give them something that I know they're going to enjoy. Well other people are coming. Um, and when I first found this wine, it was like $9.99. And it is now 
vintage after vintage has creeped up and it is $14.99 now. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was doing, when I was looking them up, they have like this wine, the Chenin Blanc Viognier actually has their own website now. So really, I, yeah. So Pine Ridge has their wine for, you know, has their website for the Cabernet and all of that stuff. And then it, it is actually Pine Ridge CBV is what the website is for this particular wine. And is that a California wine? Yes. Yeah. And um, it's, they source it from all over. So it is legit California. Um, but uh, they're on the Silverado Trail. Right, right. They um they actually have op they have vineyards all over now, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, they have vineyards all over now, um, but they were originally um, right there on the Silverado Trail, and now they've kind of sourced out. But I'm guessing if that bottle has their own website, that they got its own that Instagram too. What? It's got its own. Oh yeah, Instagram. it's on Instagram. Yeah, and Facebook. Holy cow! Yeah, it's its own. It's its own entity altogether. Um, I'm gonna have to look for that down here. I've never seen it. Oh, really? It's mm -mm. it's a goat. It's it's a good wine. Now, mm -hmm. what I what I'm saying, those who really know me, um, probably would be assuming I was raising a bottle of Ferrari Carano Fumé Blanc. <laughs> Because I am the biggest stalker of of uh, Ferrari Carano, there is. Um, but I thought I would go, you know, throw a little curveball into it. Um, but I don't know if you can see in the camera. Um, I haven't had this in a while, and I poured it, and it's got bubbles. It's got some effervescent in there, and I don't remember it being effervescent in the past. So you guys who drink it, it t it tastes fine and it smells fine, but mm. it's got it's got a little petulance in there. It's got some bubbles. Has and it been cons con bubbling consistently since you poured it? Um. Well, this is no. Um. This has been sitting for a little bit. This this glass is what's left of what was poured before we got on. So about forty minutes ago. Okay. And there's. There's a few bubbles in there, but not, you know, so they're okay. you know, dissipating, but there are still some bubbles in there. Um, it's still good, but um, I thought it was interesting. The price, the price keeps going up and up and up. Um, so I, yeah, I people are finding them. I don't think I've had anything but that from Pine Ridge, honestly. Yeah. Right. No, I haven't either. In fact, when I went to go look them up, I was like, oh, they make, they're known for Cabernet. <laughs> right. I, I don't think so. <laughs> not in my house or not. Yeah. All right. If you say so, if you say so, you know, um, but uh, so, so I'll start just about them. Um, so they actually started in 1978 and they're in the Stagsley district. Um, and they're known for the, the vineyard is actually really pretty. Uh, not that I saw it live, but there's all pine trees along the terraced vineyards. So that is where they're getting their name from. Um, but now they're all over. They're in Howell Mountain, Oakville, Rutherford, Carneros. Um, but they do, um, they are sustainable. They are certified Napa Green. Uh, so I'm always, I always like it when I like a wine and they're certified that way, you know, um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's just a little bonus in, in my eyes, you know, I don't know. How do you guys feel about, about being certified, sustainable or organic? Personally, I think it's, it's nice, but from the winery side, it's kind of a pain. So as long as they're doing you know, things that are, you know, can be considered organic or sustainable. Um, I don't care if they go through the, the red tape of getting that certification. Anybody, would anybody buy a wine specifically because they are or not because they're not? No, like it, it doesn't affect my decision making at all. I uh, just want to know that they're taking care of the earth. Yeah, I mean, I like to see it. Um, 
And I, I always like it when I find somebody is, you know, performing sustainability in their practice. Uh, but I would not, my decision would not go one way or the other based on any of that. You know, it's interesting. We were at, uh, we were in Oregon back in November and we were staying at Youngberg Hill um, and we bought some of the wines, which are now on our website. And we spent a few days with their winemaker and I asked him if they were organic and he said he actually is uh, practice is organic, but not certified because certified organic is worse than um, some of the other practices they could use. So, for example, sulfur, you can dump sulfur in the vineyard uh, and sulfur is poison. And they actually, their house is surrounded by the vineyards. His children all live there. They're all under 18. He's got a couple of dogs. He has cows uh, on the property. And his point of view was, I'd rather put something non-organic uh, in the vineyard that, that would violate the certification than actually be organic and dump poison, toxic sulfur uh, and ruin my children or my, my livestock or my pets. So um, for me, it's it's more about, like Rick said and others have said, um, do you take care of your land? Are you expecting that property to be around 100 years from now? Um, you know, are, are you, you know, people who use Roundup and spray poison, you know, that's a whole different story. But I think organic and natural has... Um, has as many faults and, and detractors, uh, detractions as, as anything else does. Anyone and you, else? And you know, as a, as a winemaker, it can be limiting, you know, and there's times where you have to make decisions uh, to, to save your crop or to, to fix, you know, if, if something's going wrong, you may have to do something to the wine to try to correct it. And if you're bound by these, rules to have this label on your bottle of wine, not to mention the price tag that you have to pay to be able to get those, that little label on your bottle. You know, if you're a winemaker, you need to do your job. And to me, that certification doesn't trump the work that you need to do. Right. I, I agree with that. And I, I, I mean, people have such issues with certain things, you know, like sulfur is like, oh, you know, the end of the world with sulfur, you know, and it's people, people don't really understand what it does and how, how it works. You know, it's, it's media, you know, it's, um, you know, they're blowing this huge issue um, and they're not really understanding what it does. Um, you know, but with, go ahead, Nick. Uh, no, to that point, I, I would agree with you, Lori. I think that it's great that young Bird Hill doesn't use it, um, you know, where I work, we, we don't um, as well, but powdery mildew is a big issue in Oregon. And if you're having to deal with it, sulfur's, I mean, yes, I might not wanna live right next to a vineyard sprayed with sulfur, but sulfur, technically it's a natural chemical and it's allowed in organic you know, winemaking. And so I, I don't have a problem if it's, if I don't have to, I guess, live in it and breathe it every day, but Right. So my you know, to me, again, if, if you are taking care of the earth around you in a responsible way, there are, you know, we, we all can spend many hours, you know, looking for organic apples or organic bananas or organic wine. And sometimes that matters and sometimes it doesn't. Here, I think it's a lofty goal. And maybe it will be, it is beneficial for that particular winemaker. But if you are not um, taking care of the, your land and taking care of your, you know, your winemaker and your people, then it's going to show in the types of wines that you're producing, in my opinion, and it'll eventually come back to bite you. Okay. I agree. Deb, what do you think? Well, I think, you know, you have to do what you have to do to put out a good product. I don't think, you know, the whole biodynamics and sustainability, I think you, you need that because I think just because you're growing something, whether it's grapes, potatoes, I mean, you have to put back into the earth what you're taking out too. Mm -hmm. So you really have to respect respect it um is it do i go out of my way does it bother me if someone is or isn't not really 
you know, I, I have to like it. I, you know, I prefer somebody that I, I know is taking care of the environment. There's, I mean, you know, so many people in years past coming up to where we are now have not. So we are paying for that in many different ways where we have to start taking care of the environment other, you know, to leave it to the next, you know, generations thereafter. So if you were, if, if you liked your bottle of wine, whatever, but for them to go organic or sustainable, they upped it a buck because it's probably not going to be up to that much. Would you pay that buck for that? Absolutely. 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 So, Jeff, I think just it because somebody is sustainable and biodynamic doesn't mean their cost of producing a a product is less expensive than somebody else's. No, in fact, it's you know, really not. It the production when you're certified like that probably is much more. Little, it, it well, I'm not sure how much the because we're not. Um, I'm not sure how much. <laughs> um, so I'm throwing out your wine. Additional yeah. it is. Oh well, I'm um, not buying your stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> and, you know, and God, Mike would like go ballistic on me because I am like I am a tree hugger. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I am a tree hugger. Um, but uh, it's you know, there's just certain things you just you you know, I don't think the production is so much more money but the regulation and the document and nick you probably you know the documentation that goes along with getting that certification and yeah. maintaining that certification and changing the facility to fit the specifications that's where the money is absolutely not in the yeah. Yeah. Nope, yeah. not at all it's all in that it's all in getting that label it's not in what you're putting in the bottle I mean, you're putting a great wine into a bottle. You're taking care of the earth. I, I'm speaking to you, Lori. I mean, you're taking you're taking care of things, right? So having the certification or not is not going to determine whether or uh, or not your customers purchase your wine. It's to me, it's you're a responsible winemaker. So that's what's important. And, and we do, we try, we do everything we can and, you know, we do as much as you can, but there's no way I would ever see myself going through that rigmarole because there's enough, there's yeah. enough red tape and paperwork and everything for everything else um, to, to do that. Um, but I get how a lot of wineries want to do it so that um, they stand out from others. But my, that was why I was asking that question is, is you've got, you know, this, this Merlot and this Merlot, they both got, you know, 92 in Wine Spectator. This one is, you know, organic certified and bio, you know, uh, certified and this is not same price, everything. Do you pick this one because everything else is equivalent, but they're I pick both and I would do a comparison. I picked the one that tastes better. <laughs> yeah. And just because they're both 92s doesn't mean I'm going to like either one of them. That, oh, that, see, that's another good, see, that's a good question yeah. for a write-up, right? There for, exactly. For writer's roundup there is. I will tell you, at one of the wine stores that I go to frequently here in Charleston, this was many, many years ago. We walked in and I, she, the owner of this store knows her customers. And I walked up to a bottle of wine that on it, I'm going to out myself here and say, I liked the label. Okay. Nothing I'm wrong just, with that. I know I, I liked the label. I picked up the bottle of wine and the wine store owner saw it. And she said, is that for you or is that for Gary? And I said, it's for me. And she said, then put it back. You will hate it. And I said, yeah, but I read about it and it got this huge score. She goes, I'm telling you, put it back because you're going to hate it or buy it for Gary and then taste it 
and you'll see that I was right. <laughs> and she was absolutely right. I hated the wine. It was not my palate type. It was not my preferences. It was everything about a wine that I typically didn't like at that point in time in my life. Um, and it had this outrageous score that didn't mean anything to me. Right. I get it. I get it. Um, so let, let's go back to what um, initially I was thinking in terms of uh, what your wine is. Debbie, do you want to talk about the winery a bit? You got any info on them? Sure. Let, um, let me pour myself some first. Absolutely. Can't I talk know. about it with an empty glass. I know. I know. So Wait, actually, you haven't, you haven't poured any yet? To begin oh, with. This, this is my third glass. Oh, no, no. Okay. Sure Debbie has emptied the glass. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing this really wrong if that's what we're supposed to be so doing. I, I came home, had a glass. I'm going to have to go back for another <laughs> bottle here in a minute. <laughs> this, this is my third. Don't. Um, so, <clears throat> Cooney was, I'll uh, tell you how I got introduced to it, was a winery. Um, went out to California for a friend of mine's wedding. And, um, she, uh, we went to her house, we got off the plane, went to her house, she packed us with a picnic basket and sent us on our way. And she said, you have to go to Kundi. So it was Paul and I go up to snow, but we go to Kundi. And um, we really liked it. And obviously they're Sauvignon Blanc. So it was just one of those wines that grew on us and I just love it. And people that come, you know, that's our house, um, our house, uh, our house white, I guess I would say. So kundi has been around for a really long time. I don't know if any of you have been up there to uh, Kundi. Uh, but it, yep. Yeah, it's right by, I hate to say, it's right by where the fires were. Um, but uh, It doesn't have, really narrow it down. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. That's a pretty big um, plot. Um, they have an awesome, awesome cave. Really, really cool cave. But um, Louis Kundi immigrated here from Germany. And um, he purchased what was called the Wildwood Vineyards Ranch. And it's on um, red volcanic soil. And it was actually first planted in 1879 by John Drummond, who imported cuttings from Chateau Margaux and Lafitte Rothschild. So as, as life gone on, when he passed away, it was taken over by his sons. And then um, a couple of his sons were drafted. But um, even today, it's still within the family, I believe. Um, fifth or sixth generation, they have, um, let me see how much they have. I think a thousand, a thousand acres parcel. And within their, their whole um, parcel that's around their vineyard or around, you know, the tasting room, whatever area, they all have different micro, microclimates within it. So it, it's kind of really cool. Um, their bonded winery number 202. Um, anything which else? Which means what? That means that they were the 200 and second, and second winery. winery bonded with in, in California. Okay. I mean, they have a great, um, I don't know if you did the mountaintop tasting, but they have a tasting at yeah. 1800, 1800 feet with. These thick views of, of Sonoma Valley, um, they usually pour a couple of whites and the rest reds, and they take you on a very long tour um, in sort of a weird Jeep type vehicle. And it's uh, it's a real blast. It's about 50 bucks, um, but just a lot of fun on a beautiful summer day. It's it's so cool out there, both cool, like fun cool, but it's also weather temperature cool. Yeah. Just, just real, just a blast. Yeah, all those different micro or macro climates, I get them yeah, yeah. confused. Um, within the whole vineyard and everything, which really makes it pretty unique. So. Huh? Right, and they have good red wines too. Totally. I mean, their their whole their whole portfolio is 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 pretty is pretty good. Jeff, do you have more on uh, this wine that I've never heard of? That apparently I'm the only one on the face of the earth who hasn't. Um. You know, not a lot. They've got they've got uh, uh, facilities in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. Um, a beautiful, you know, green, lots of green apple, lots of minerality, uh, just a beautiful nose. Um, just, I just really enjoy this uh, this bottle of uh, bubbles. I, I have to honestly say, I don't think I would 
I don't, my brain doesn't go to New Mexico for, for grapes. For, I mean, you know, I know it's there, but I don't really, not in the forefront of my brain. You don't think of it as a Pinot, uh, Pinot Noir uh, safe haven? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think, I think, uh, when you're there, you, I, I, you know, I don't know exactly how it works because I agree. You think of New Mexico as more of like, you know, the Arizona desert, you know, or, or, uh, but it may have something to do with altitude, um, or just with how they grow their grapes. I don't know what kind of, uh, you know, canopy management they use. Uh, but, and it's also bubbles. So, you know, they're able to blend. Then it sits on lees for, you know, generally with these are two years on lees before they're going to be re uh, uh, releasing them, you know, so there's some, there's some work that the winemaker can do to, to get it right. Uh, but he found the conditions he wanted in, in New Mexico. And, uh, you know, I've had uh, Vivac uh, out of New Mexico. They do some fantastic wines. Uh, I've had other wines from New Mexico and they're, there are some really good wines coming out of uh, New Mexico. Well, and keep in mind that in New Mexico, you've got some really, um, you know, skiable mountains. I mean, so yeah. they've got yeah. the mountains and they've got the desert. So yeah. somewhere in between all of that, you're going to have this opportunity to grow grapes. Yeah, there's good there's good altitude out there that they can use exactly. with. And, you know, when you're looking at that kind of environment as well, you're talking huge potential diurnal shifts uh, that are going to allow that sugar to come up during the daytime, but then that sugar is going to plummet and that acidity is going to rock it up at night. You know, so you've got, you've got some play there with the grapes and what they're going to be able to do and how they're going to be able to struggle and, and, you know, what they can produce. And because it's New Mexico, you're going to get it at 17 or 18.99 exactly 30.99 cuz it's coming from California. <laughs> yeah. Jim, did did you have some you had a new Mexico winery people? Yeah, Vivac. You like drinking, right? Yeah, Viva Vivac uh winery. Uh we had them on uh Michelle uh, they had some, oh my God, they had so, some fantastic wines that we were drinking on the show. They, they, they shared it with us for everybody on the show and, uh, just some beautiful stuff that they're producing there. I couldn't, I was really surprised by it because it was a lot of reds. Um, there was, I can't even remember the name of there's a grape that I had never even heard of before something out of Italy that they'd found grow grew really well in their environment, but they're talking uh, a much higher elevation uh, than you know what most of us are use are, are used to. I think you know over six thousand feet possibly, as far as what they're growing grapes in. Wow! Oh wow! Holy cow! Now I'm gonna have to go look it up because they're probably <laughs> I'm probably about to get an email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, they're they are on live chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Um. So John, what do you what do you got for us? What what winery uh, info you got for us? Well, first, I have to say I have a microphone envy from Jeff. That is a, that is a <laughs> well. Yeah, you got to be careful what you ask for because that <laughs> microphone attacks. So. Yes, sure. it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, anyway, impressive, I will say. Um, so you know, just to put things into perspective, I think. So we talked about Bonded Winery two hundred eight or. 288 or whatever it was. So Wente was 202. 202. Wente is like eight something, 860. Uh, and they were bonded in 1883. So one of us to the first winery in California bonded in 1857. Um, Good luck Bunshu was bonded in, in 1858. They were number two. So whenever Kunde came along, they were two, whatever you said, 208. Uh, and then we have eight something Wente. So Wente claims to be the, lo the longest operating, uh, never closed family winery uh, in the United States. So they didn't close for prohibition. They weren't destroyed by phylloxera uh, in the 1800s. So they've been making wine for a very long time. Most of that wine was bulk wine uh, sold to um, companies like Gallo and, and so forth in the early days. They made a little bit of their own wine. And I think it's really in the last 30 years where they have started producing wines, significant amounts of wine on their own label. Um, 
still, if you look at their impressive list of uh, employees, it's uh, Wenti, Wenti, Wenti everywhere. I mean, uh, just like it is at Kunde, just like it is at, um, uh, which I think mostly it's the Bunchus, not the Gunlocks that are running around at Gunlock Bunchu. Um, but they've managed to keep the family uh, in the winery operation. So I think they're on a fourth generation uh, winemaker uh, right now. So really impressive winery. I think we were talking about prices. I don't buy a lot of $20 wine because I live in Napa. Um, <laughs> we, when we first moved here, we were drinking a lot of Spanish wine because that's what I grew up on. And $20 is a really decent Spanish wine. We had so so much sticker shock the first two years. We went places and, you know, a, a really average cab might be 80 or 90 and 100. Then after a while, two years later, we were like, oh, that cab's 70 bucks. I wonder what's wrong with it. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that's the that's the sort of the, the bad thing that happens to you. And then people would tell us about Washington Cab, and we would laugh, and then we would taste it and think, oh, my God, it's just as good as anything else. And that's what I feel about this Wednesday wine. So obviously they've been doing it for 130 years or so. Um, they've been doing it in the same family, uh, in the same set of traditions. Um, they have a region that, that, that is – they have great soil there. Um, it's also a region that has the diurnal shifts that Jeff was talking about where it gets really hot uh, during the day, but because they're in that valley, it also gets really cool at night. Um, so that actually has a really good benefit and they have a tremendous amount of wind uh, that blows through there. So it, it creates a dynamic, I think, that's, uh, that's really unusual. So um, I'm going to run down to a little bit more sometime this spring. Um, if you guys, some of you guys know Kent and Robin from uh, Appetite for Wine, they were there this last weekend and um, and they were they raved about it, and they posted some great pictures and, and some stuff on Facebook and Twitter. I've got to get down there because the wine is um, is really high quality, but it looks like the tasting experiences are what Napa used to be maybe 25, 30 years ago, where it's relatively inexpensive but really open, where you get to meet the winemaker, um, and those are the kind of experiences we really like. I've been to Wednesday. It's yeah. Really, it's, yeah, I went to a, actually, I went to a concert there. Cool. Who'd you see? Yeah, right. So, uh, what did I see? I saw Ario Speedwagon, and then me and Ario Speedwagon, the band members, went and tasted in the tasting room. You were tasting I, with the Ario Speedwagon. I was tasting with, yes, Kevin Cronin and, yeah, Dave and, yeah. Nice. Okay, I'm reaching yeah. out to touch you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's how the internet works. Right? Uh, well, whatever. <laughs> I have pictures. I have to dig them up. Yeah, we all have pictures. It's just what we're using them for. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my brain automatically goes right to Friends because it's on TV all the time, and I like can do every episode of it. Uh, but that just made me think of the episode where they went to go see Hootie and the Blowfish, uh -huh. right? And they're like, "Is that a hickey?" Who did that? That would be the work of a blowfish. Um, <laughs> No, I um, I, the tour was manager. Paul with you? No, <laughs> my girlfriend's from California. I was with. Ah. It was, okay, it was speaking, my, one of. My I was gonna say, speaking of of Hootie and the Blowfish, do mm -hmm. any of you know which member of Hootie and the Blowfish is part owner in a winery? Darius Rucker. It's the only name I know. Yeah, I, was say, name I, know. <laughs> I don't even know his name. It's yeah, just the guy with the long hair and the thing. Yeah. He, he, well, if he has <laughs> any long hair and the thing, I don't know. Yeah. But he, um, it's the bass guitarist. He actually, yeah. I just went to a wine tasting, and he's part owner of, and they're in um, Sonoma County, actually. Wow. There's, there's quite a few rockers train. Train has their own way. Yeah. yeah. And I saw I saw Train and Hootie together um and sat next to uh Hootie, sat next to Darius's mother. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh the I think it's the lead singer from Tool has a winery down in Arizona. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of them, you know, they they have got that money and I was just gonna say you gotta do something with the money, buy a winery. Yeah. So I got I got to bring it back because I got to see if you guys know it. So uh, the Vivac Winery I was talking about for before. So Aglianico, theirs is spe spectacular. But then the one I'd never heard of or had before was a Rafosco. 
I don't know if you guys have heard of that grape before, but I had never heard of it. I uh, just had it. You did you really? Who who was making it that you had it? Um, uh, uh, Matthiason. Oh, okay. really? Yeah. Then him and I college together. Yeah. Nice. So this that was the first one I'd ever had, um, and it was of all the wines we tried that night, it, the Refusco was by far my favorite. Such an interesting interesting wine. Nick, uh, you're uh, you're studying now, so you know that one. You know, I, I have not tried one before. No, okay. my brain is like I'm ready to explode right now. <laughs> <laughs> Stop naming like grape varietal. Like, oh, I feel uh, we, I feel bad for you. I really. You sent, me that, you sent me that piece of paper, and I'm like, nope, I'm done. Nope, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and you're going, you're going, you're going for level three. Is that right? Which, or which, what are you doing? Yeah, diploma. Oh, diploma. Oh my word. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I don't know if you guys saw that. Uh, you guys know that uh, Amber and Dave from uh, formerly Napa Food and Vine, now Wine Travel Eats, they're in London, and they just took the WSET one. And their their description of the the exam, is, uh, I feel like I should, wouldn't even need to study for it and, and go in and. And pass it. It's like the questions like which of these is a red grape varietal? <laughs> it's like Sauvignon Blanc, Albarino, something, and Cap. <laughs> yeah, okay. Number Fosco. Yes. <laughs> Watch that. When I take it, that'll be on the exam. Right. Like that. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to go, I didn't even know that was a grape. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick. What, what about your your guy, your your special wine? All right. So again, Altos Las Hormigas. Um, they hold you a very that so well. Oh, thank you. Um, I probably say it really well just because that's the winery that I actually cut my teeth on, um, working in the industry, uh, moving down to Argentina. Uh, founded in 1995 by Antonio Moriscalchi and Alberto Antonini. Um, Alberto Antonini is a famous Italian winemaker who uh, does consulting uh, around the world, even like Segesio and Sonoma. He's their consulting winemaker. Um, let's see, the name Altos Las Hormigas, it used to be Altos Las Madrano, which is the town where the actual bodega is at. But uh, when they planted the vineyard, all these little ants started to eat the baby vines. So, uh, and all the field workers basically said that the ants owned the land. Um, so what they did is they uh, spread little ashes, little ant ashes around the vineyard to kind of detract them. Uh, at which point, once the vines wait, actually- Wait, 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 ant ashes? Mm -hmm. Like they burned ants and spread their ashes? Like You can, you can, have it, you can actually purchase like, yeah, ash of uh, little insects to detract insects. It's natural. It's organic. It's organic. organic. It's, it's, organic. <laughs> uh, it's like a warning, right? It's like a warning. Yeah. Exactly. And so. <laughs> saying it's organic, Nick. That's okay. We're going to go with it. <laughs> um, but that is how they decided to change the name to Altos Las Hormigas because the ants really own the land there. Um, so they have the couple vineyards down in the Lujan de Cujo area, but then um, up in the Baixa de Uco, we're talking 4,000 to 6,000 feet elevation, uh, vineyards in the Altamira, Vista Flores, and Gualtajari area. That's where uh, Gualtajari, Chupangado area is where this particular wine uh, comes from. Um, a lot less of the limestone soils that they particularly uh, like to use. Um, it's more gravel, so free draining, but um, the vintage that I'm drinking right now, first time I've actually had this vintage, it's 15. Um, tastes a little young right now, and that's because they actually harvested about 15 days earlier, um, and that's because the heat in December Jan and January was super hot, and they're trying to go away from that extracted jamminess. Um, so they picked early. Uh, it's really coming together. Nice, you know, red fruit, um, bright acid. Not again, not what you expect from a Malbec. And um, one thing I love about 
Argentinian Malbec, especially from smaller producers or ones that you can actually find there and not here in uh, the States, it's like a $20 bottle drinks like a $40 bottle. $50 bottles, you're getting, you know, something equivalent to California $100 bottle. And so um, this was aged 50% in concrete, no, stainless steel, 25% uh, in concrete, and 25% uh, in Fudra. So there you go. Very good. Oh, and they use Pedro Parra, who is a terroir specialist who travels around the world digging soil pits and working with wineries to talk about their soils. So, you know, when they talk about uh, their terroir, they know what they're talking about. So that's my shameless plug for a winery that I love. Near and dear. <laughs> exactly. Love it. Hey, Nick. Oh. All right, Rick, what you got? All right. Well, like I said, I'm drinking the the Melinda Melinda Gestock Gilheim Rosé. This is it's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. The it the name of the winery is Mas du du Mas de Gassac. It's the Gassac Valley in the Languedoc. And if you're picturing France, folks, you know you've got Provence over to the west or to the east, and you've got Languedoc over to the west um, that actually go bounce butts up against Spain. And this winery is not that, you know, they're kind of like right at in the at the beginning of Languedoc. So when we were staying um, in Provence, it was just an hour's drive over there. The first vines were grown in this in this valley in the eighth century. So there have been vines growing in this area uh, for centuries, of course. Charlemagne was involved in making sure that they were well taken care of, et cetera. But we're going to fast forward from the 8th century all the way up to the 1970s when um, Ami Hibert or Gilbert, Hibert in France, French and Gilbert in English, bought the land. He and his wife bought the land. They were looking to slow life down. He was a a, a leather tanner, um, bought the land, and fortunately for him, had a friend who was a geologist, a well-known geologist in, in France, um, and he came and studied the soil and said, you have to buy this farm um, and you have to plant grapes because this soil has property, you know, it's glacial properties that um, they wish they had in Bordeaux, making some of the best you know, Grand Cru Bordeaux, Bordeaux um, in France. And so they bought the farm and immediately started uh, planting grapes. They brought in some grapes, some varietals from Bordeaux, and they make excellent, excellent wine. But the thing about this particular wine that we like so much is it's classic French rosé. It's crisp. It's 50% Syrah, 50% Carignan, which is not the typical provincial rosé. But this, I mean, it's, it's bright. Um, it's got flavors of strawberries and melon and uh, Asian pear. And it just works all year long for us. But it's hot here all year long, pretty much. Um, and... You know, it doesn't hurt that when you travel thousands of miles and you get to go to the winery and you're walking in their fields, you tend to get an affection for them. Um, and at a $10.99 price point, it's something that is very easy to just have in your cellar um, and drink it throughout the year. Um, we had just finished our 2016 vintage about a month ago. And so we had a little bit of a lag. We were, you know, what I was saying, we were drinking rosé remnants that we could find <laughs> in our cellar. And, uh, and cellar means one of many uh, wine freezer or refrigerators that we have. Um, but uh, it, it's a great wine. They're great people. Um, and uh, for every day, 
I love 1099. 1099 is good. Yeah, yeah. You can't beat that. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a, that's that's a six pack. That's a case right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, I don't know how they make it and sell it so that we can buy it for so little. Uh, yeah. it, it baffles me. It absolutely baffles me. I mean, I'm I can close my eyes and picture their seller. I can picture their tanks and. How are they selling this to us for ten ninety nine? We don't know, but it's great. Doesn't it always like baffle you between the cost of the bottle, the cost of labor, and everything? How the prices? Let it me does. tell you from from our end. From our end, I it blows my mind when I see a seven ninety nine or a ten ninety nine bottle in a store because there's absolutely no way. I can get anywhere near that, you know. And then when it's shipped, and you know, coming from overseas, and it's on a container ship, right? right. And, and John, now you know that aspect of it—the importing of it. Like, I mean, how long when when you take a wine from out of the country? How long is that in? Um, I'm blanking on the word. Blanking on the word of customs, whatever. Customs. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> customs. <laughs> Like, we'll, clear, we'll clear customs usually the same day, but um, the the wine. So we have to go from the winery to a port. So, for example, our our Croatia wine has to drive all the way around Croatia through Venice down the coast to La Spezia. That's that's five hundred bucks for for one pallet. Um, then the wine has to get on a giant container ship that comes to New York. That's a grand for one pallet. Then it's believe it or not the truck. Thank you, unions. The truck from New York to California, that's another grand. Um, so when I look at, I was at Whole Foods the other day and I saw a Sauvignon Blanc from France for $4.99 and I almost tipped over the display. I was like, this is, just, <laughs> this is absolute bullshit. It's not fair. I oh, now, I've got, now I have to put, now I have to put a... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I was, use it. that was French, by the way. That was French. Okay. Just, just bleep it. You know, just bleep it. So, so, so I, I think about, like, I know that it cost me about $3 and something a bottle uh, for the entire shipment on a pallet. Now, these guys are shipping more than a pallet. But, but $4.99, honestly, it, my guess is they shipped it in bulk in a giant bladder somewhere on a ship where uh, it was probably $0.30. Cents. Um uh, to ship the wine, and then they rebottle it in the United States. A lot of these wines, I don't think anything under ten dollars um, can be can be a quality bottle um, with with non bulk shipment. Um, just because it's impossible. I mean, just the taxes uh, that are paid per gallon, just the taxes and excise and duties that when you enter the United States, it seems unlikely uh, to make it. Um, so I, you know, it, it's frustrating for us because you know I can't get a wine. From Italy that I buy, I buy for four dollars. I can't sell it for less than about fifteen, just for the cost of getting it here. Um, so when I see a nine dollar wine, I think, my God, what, you know, what am I missing? What do they have to do to get it there? Yeah, exactly. Now sometimes it's scale, right? So if if you're selling selling a thousand uh, cases, uh, or two thousand cases, or five thousand cases of some wine. Then, then maybe it's thirty or forty cents a bottle, but still, a four ninety nine Sauvignon Blanc is is pretty hard to to fathom uh, where where that price could have come from. Even for people who don't have to pay a mortgage on the property because their family's owned it for a thousand years, and I mean, just the cost of production has got to be more than four dollars. So that's interesting. That's really interesting, John. Um, so, Rick, on your wine, does it does it say anything about if it was bottled, uh, you know, on location, or does it have any kind of information about where it was bottled? It was bottled in France. Yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, it was absolutely bottled in France. I mean, we were in their facility, which is, you know, in an old mill. Um, it, it, it's astonishing to me that it can be sold for so little. I mean, 
And 1099 used to be, you know, you know, if you if you go look back in my wine life, you know, there was a time when 799 was, oh, I'm not paying any more than that. Right. And then it was 1099. Well, now it's, you know, it's whatever I want. And it's not because I, you know, am rich. It's because I value what's in the bottle. And this... I will, I, you know, I know that if I'm looking at a $4.99 Sav Blanc, I don't care where it's from or a, you know, $6.99 grocery store wine. I'm not, you know, I'm just not going to buy it. But thankfully, in, th in my case, this particular wine, it's like I understand its entire provenance from vineyard to, m to my home. And that's just quite a, I mean, it's a value that unfortunately for you, John, stinks. It does stink. I'll tell you, how many of you guys were at the Wine Bloggers Conference and went to the Carinina um, tasting? Um, so one, I was, I was there. Yeah, so as someone who grew up, my mother would only drink Rioja wine. So, you know, we, we didn't drink a lot of, uh, even like Roberto del Duero was like prohibited in our house until uh, fairly recently. And so when I tasted the Carignano wine, I was thinking, this isn't going to be able to hold up. But I'll tell you, the, the relative quality of the, the Garnacha and the Carignana, the 100-year vine, vine wine, which retails in the U.S. for like 25 bucks, all the way down to the entry-level wine, which is $9. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm in love with Garnacha right now, and 9 bucks is pretty damn good. And there wasn't a wine in that tasting, and there was, I think, six wines we tasted that I wouldn't have. On a, on a Tuesday night or a Monday night or Wednesday night. They're not all Saturday night or Friday night wines, but they're eminently drinkable. And I think the cheapest one of them goes for $9.99, which means that it was probably purchased at the winery for a dollar, uh, a bottle. Um, so and that's incredible. That's, that's incredible. absolutely incredible. Yeah. So, so Rick, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to springboard off of what Jeff was, I think, getting at. What, when you flip that bottle around, mm -hmm. what what does it say? Does it say cellared and bottled by, produced and bottled by? Is that where you were going, Jeff? Or <clears throat> yeah, it was. Yeah. Because I mean, uh, I know they may bottle on premise, but for what they ship to the U.S., it may they may bulk ship it and then it gets bottled here. Right. It says bottled in France. It's in French. It's saying it in French, and I know enough French to know what the word bottle is. Um, but it was bottled in France. That's so, so that's that just means that it costs about a dollar a dollar a bottle, uh, maybe a dollar fifty a bottle for the uh, for the importer who, who paid for it at that level and then paid for the shipping and then put their big fat margin on it and and selling it for ten ninety nine. It's amazing, by the way. I, I envy it. I don't I don't poke holes at it. I just I just think it's it's amazing, and there's there's a, a, some level of power of scale. So they can't be bringing just a few cases of this. So they're bringing a lot of it, yeah. so they're getting the benefit of scale. Yeah, yeah. It's just, and actually, I mean, to to that point, John, the wine shop that I buy from, when she purchases the wine every year, she's buying a pallet just for her store. Just for her store. Wow. Yeah. So how many yeah. other stores are buying a pallet? just for their store in the States. So they might have half that container ship. Exactly, exactly. I yeah. mean, I, I know that when I was up in, on the Cape and I walked into this wine store and the entire front end cap was all this wine. And I was like, what are you, oh my God, I can't believe you have this. And they were like, well, yeah, we buy a pallet every time it comes in because oh. it's so good. Well, and it's it's flip glass, it's screw cap, so you know the cogs on it are going to be a lot less than you know anything else. Great point. True. Great point. I will say the um, the one of our producers in Croatia they make one barrel of wine every year, which is as you guys know about twenty five cases. So we we have an annual negotiation now where we negotiate how many bottles we're going to get not how many pallets or cases because they can't even fill up a half a pallet so none of our producers produce enough wine 
Um, and because they're mostly small family producers, if they get wiped out one year, the weather sucks a different year, something else happens with mold or mildew or, or shatter or something, you know, they'll say, hey, last year I know I gave you 50 cases, but this year I've only got 10. Um, so we're kind of dancing around uh, filling up pallets sometimes with, I've got literally, uh, I'll have six bottles of something and then 60 bottles of something and 150 bottles of something else. Um, and the only reason we've been able to survive, I think, some some months is that we have the U.S. production where I can just drive up to Oregon with a with my big SUV and, and, and pack in my Vidon and my Youngberg and uh, and my ghost tail and, and my sass and the other wines and bring them down here myself and I don't have to worry about that that really big long trip um, you know from Europe that takes almost a month um, I can be up and back in 48 hours but that's one of the things that you do that so many other wine uh, retailers don't do is you're you're looking for the small producer the family the family producer and the fact that you're looking in Croatia um, to me, that was incredibly appealing, and I don't know whether any of the Croatians' wines that I just recently bought from you or any of that from that segment that you know only makes that little bit. But, all of them, all of them. But the but the thing, but the reality of that is, is that there are very few stores in most American cities where you can walk into and find Croatian wine, and if you're a wine geek like I am. You want to try it. You have to. You, you you know enough about wine's history that you have to go to Croatia to taste what the beginning started like. Yeah, and so it's, that, it's that's a, a niche for you, and and you and you should be willing to pay for that. Definitely. Well, thank you. Yes, and we are, and it's but it's a little bit like being organic, right? There's there's a penalty to it, which is that. Um, you know, there's not a lot of consistency uh, to the to the process, and whereas a big importer uh, like you know Chambers and Chambers and these companies that do billions of cases, you know they've got a commitment from a winery for ten thousand cases every year, and they know it's going to taste the same, it's going to look the same, it's going to smell the same, it's going to be the same price, and so that's the easier route. But um, we we actually don't like that, and we so we're glutton for punishment. We just thought we really want to bring wines from people who can't actually access the market. So anyway, it's been a blast. I, I, wait, wait till we bring the uh, Herzegovina wines. That'll make the Croatian wines look mainstream. There we um, go. Now I we're can't talking. wait for that. I cannot wait. <laughs> I still, I have to taste the wines I got from you. I still I haven't know, had a do. chance to taste them yet. Yeah. I, I have mine on a calendar of when I'm allowed to open the first bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you I just might have to Corvan it before I go to that Croatian tasting in the city. It's yes, for like a, I like, are going to a Croatian tasting on the 26th. Oh, yeah, you're going to the, the – so, so, yes, there could be some great um, people there. You guys know exotic wine travel, right, and, uh, Matthew and Shireen that that uh, wrote that book, Cracking Croatia, um, Cracking Croatia Wine. They're going to be um, – they'll be there. And um, and then uh, Cliff Rames, who's the editor of Psalm Journal, who's also a – a big expert on Croatian wine will also be there. So I, I think you guys will really enjoy that. I, I couldn't make it out there because I have two trips to New York coming up in the, uh, in the late spring. So I, I had to prioritize which one I could go to, but that, that should be a blast. That's awesome. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I unfortunately can't be there till like the very tail end. Um, cause you know, got that day job that actually pays the bills. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm heading uh, I'll be there for like the last hour and a half of it. Oh, great. At least I'll get to taste. Um, so I'm just, is everybody ready for a riddle? Sure, go here. for it. You ready uh -oh. for a riddle? Oh, where's, where's, your, where's your Riddler costume? Oh, uh -oh. I should get one. Next cut, that will be this, this mascot. Right? <laughs> I've got right. Elmo for Wine from Bed Street, you know. Uh, all right, so, so here we go. Ready? It says, I can be quick and then I'm deadly. I am a rock, shell, and bone medley. If I was made into a man, I'd make people dream. I gather in millions by ocean, sea, and stream. Sand. Sand. Who said that? John did, I think. John. And Nick. Nick. I, think, I think Nick and I are tied. Yeah. Ah. 
Yes, sand. Sand. All right. Good job, John. All right. I would. I well, would give you a the full bottle yet. <laughs> give you both a visual sign of what I feel right now for the fact that you guessed it so soon. But I don't want Lori to have to up the um the ratings. Explicit. <laughs> but know that I'm sending you my. Willing <laughs> hand gestures. <laughs> Two hands, I would guess, right? Yes, one for each of you. <laughs> Do, it like this. Do it like this. This, this. Yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. You know what, Jan Nancy's Robinson may be an MW, but let's see if she would get that answer correct. There right. You there you go. So, so what I was thinking is, um, you know, like you always have to play a game. There's always got to be a game. Uh, so I was thinking the riddle and, uh, if you guys are willing to come back on, you know, whatever you guys can, I want to, you know, how Sunday night football always has, or Monday night football has the running tally of, you know, uh -huh. which announcers have won what. Um, so that's what I thought we, I would do, but if you guys are willing sure, to come back to another episode. <laughs> I got to so get to 50%. percent so yeah. and Nick, a kid, uh, they both get a point, I'm assuming? They will both get a point. They will both get a point for this one because I, I, that was pretty much Well, I'm not good at riddles, so I'll always I'm have gonna, a zero. Yeah, I'm going to suck at this, but I'm here, and I'm ready to well, go. Maybe we should be a team. <laughs> I don't know what's oh, going to help. That might be good. That might be good. I don't think I'm going to help much. <laughs> Sand. <laughs> that is the answer from now on. I'm in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, what do you know for sand? So, yeah. so Jeff, you're always really good at coming up with the with your quote, uh, the, your movie quote, um, that or and your you know grape hop or pop that somewhat yeah. correlates to the people who come. Maybe I'll start being more you know. As opposed to just Googling and pulling up the first <laughs> riddle that comes I'm telling up. you, just, just Google and pull it up because after a while it gets to be so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I had a blast and I hope you guys did too. And I just want to give you guys, you know, like, a, you know, a minute to wrap up. You know, this is your time to, you know, promote yourselves, let everybody else know where they can find you, what you're doing, what you're looking forward to in this next week, whatever, you know, one minute in the spotlight. And I'm going to go the other way this time because, you know, that's the educator on me. You can't always pick the same person to go first, you know. So, Rick, that means it's you. Ah, I was afraid of that. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed being here tonight with everybody. Uh, my blog is Strong Coffee to Red Wine. And my tagline is, powering through the day drinking coffee until it's acceptable to drink wine. And I don't know anybody who doesn't agree with that sentiment. I agree with that one. Yes. It doesn't Check me live, out at Strong Coffee to Red Wine. doesn't live that sentiment. You can find me on Instagram at, at Coffee to Red Wine, on Twitter at, at Coffee to Red Wine. Lori, this was a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nick? So I am at wine calm guy um, on Instagram, Twitter. My blog is wine calm guy uh, with W set diploma right now. There's a lot of drafts, so you're not going to find a lot of posts right now. Um, but yeah, uh, again, at wine calm guy. And also when I'm not drinking this as in my everyday wine, it's probably Dracina, um, you know, Cap Franc. Oh, I love you. Oh, 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 what a suck us. That's and, shameless. And possibly, and possibly a Syrah Rosé. Oh, 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 shameless. Then you all wonder why I love Nick so much. Oh. <laughs> he just got, he's just going for points. I was going to say, he wants bonus points. And Nick, this is what I got to say to you. I'm back up here. <laughs> So, Nick, our next uh, House of Pendragon beer on me, buddy. Nice. John, what you got? Well, this really has been a blast. I actually follow all of you guys. Um, so it's actually really cool to, to see everybody and talk to everybody. Um, I'm at Double Tune Vino on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, our our uh, e-commerce 
Winesitis, topachinas.com. Anyone who wants to buy uh, wine, I'll give you a 15% discount, which is essentially most of our markup. Um, so if you put in Friends 15, uh, you'll get a discount on our wines. Um, we just added uh, Marcus Wine from Lodi. We just added, we're about to add, we actually just added um, Acquiesce Wine from Lodi. We're about to add Bokish Wine from Lodi. Uh, this weekend I'll put up Sask Wine, which makes some incredible Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris uh, from Oregon. And of course there's the Spanish and Italian and Croatian wines that we have on the site. Um, just really be curious and honored if you guys would buy some taste it, let me know what you think and anything you don't like I'll, I'll refund your money. That's how the confident I feel in the wine that we sell. Are you talking to just us or is this to anyone who's listening? <laughs> well, that's it. Anyone who's listening can, uh, I'll, I'll stand by that offer. Okay. And I think you need to spell your website because it's such an interesting name that- Why don't you put it in the chat too? Oh well, yeah, that's a great idea. But for, you know, for the you know, for the listeners, it's not the easiest to guess as you're typing. But it will right, be, so. you know what, John? I in the homepage notes um, for the podcast, I will put your link in there. And if you want to give me that coupon code again, I'll put that in there if you would like. And on the bottom of the YouTube video in the comments, I will put. Um, you know, I'll, all of your social media, all of your websites, I'll That's have great. a link to everybody's website in the on my homepage. Fantastic, thank you guys. Jeff? Oh, you want me? Lean, oh, lean in, Jeff, lean in. All right, here we go. I, I like sitting back and just absorbing everything that's going on. All right. Wait, wait, before you go, I gotta go, Jeff. You know, as, as I've been watching you more and more, you no longer take off your glasses as often as you used to. No, they're just shot at this point. It, it, I've just, I've, I have to actually go get some real glasses at this point. I'm just, I've gotten too old and my eyes are too poor. So for, for those of you who don't know, there there's the running joke on the We Like Drinking podcast. There it is. <laughs> they count how many times he takes his glasses on and off during the podcast. And I think they've stayed on the entire time tonight. They pretty much have. There's a couple of times I took it off when I didn't have to read anything. But uh, or, when I was sitting back and then I could see the screen. But when I come on forward, I've got to have them on or everybody's just uh, eight eight bit. Uh, pixelated uh, uh, face. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna get in podcast mode here, Lori. So hold on, so hold on. Uh, so join us every Friday on the We Like Drinking podcast. You can find it on your favorite uh, podcast catcher app at We Like Drinking. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at We Like Drinking, and on Twitter, Lori at We Like Drinking One. Why? Because some college punk kid 10 years ago grabbed We Like Drinking, has posted two times, and has never posted again. I, I, I see you, and you, you make me angry. Uh, we drop every Friday morning. You can find the show. Uh, we have awesome guests. We've had Lori on the show, winemakers, beer makers the whole gamut of the drinking universe that we have on the show. I think I'm going to get some of the people around this panel on here uh, on as well in the near future. Hint, hint, uh, wink, wink to all of you that I'm looking at right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is where you can find the award winning. Uh, we like drinking award winning, award winning. And you are also offering a special deal right now too. Absolutely. We got all kinds of cool stuff going on right now. If you ever have ever heard of Eco Vessel, uh, they are a insulated uh, product for storing your water, storing your beer, storing your wine. We are giving away two 64 ounce growlers uh, and those come with an infuser. So you can put like lemon in your water. Uh, you can it, at, at, you can brew tea, you can brew coffee, you can do all kinds of stuff with that. You just have to Live review. In California, you can brew all up. Right, so yeah. wait a second, Jeff. I listened to that the other day when I was driving to work. Yeah, yeah. And I have a podcast player on my Samsung, so I'm not Apple. And I can't figure out how to write a review. Here's what you do. Okay. Cause I understand the Apple podcast application is horrible. If you don't have a Macintosh product, here's what you do. 
you tweet us something that you like about the show, hashtag eco vessel in it, I'll put you in it. Okay. All right. And just for the record, even those of us who are Apple, there are those of us that are technically challenged. <laughs> and I wrote your review, but I couldn't figure out all the other <laughs> rules. And so you got the review. There's no echo vessel, hashtag, whatever the heck I was supposed to do. But yes, I love your show. And so keep it so going. I, I, I love the intro of it. Thing. So Dean, Dean, Dean. And I knew it was him. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You're... You're in it to win it and you're in it to win it. So everybody's in it to win it. So yes. yeah. Uh, and also if you want to purchase an eco vessel, uh, yes, if, you do, if you do, yes, you did. And I appreciate that so much. If you use WLD 30, you get 30% off uh, your first order from them and they've got some fantastic products. So definitely check that out. You can find it all at we like drinking.com where you never, you never drink, drink alone. <laughs> Me and Jerry Lois, thank you. As you can tell, I don't listen to them at all. I, I got a lot of little excited there. I'm sorry. I even was telling the late the photographer that's hanging her stuff at the restaurant about the wine bottle thing for the beach from the oh. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't have it in here. Usually I have it in here, but it's also a 750 milliliter yeah. uh, bottle shaped like a wine bottle. It comes with a funnel. Comes with a funnel. I love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Comes with a cleaner. Funnel. Comes with a cl collapsible silicone <laughs> funnel. Uh, it comes with a cleaner that you can pour a whole bottle into it. Keeps it keeps it at temperature for 36 hours. It's a it's crazy. Yeah. Case. There is so much wrong with that description. I don't know. <laughs> but I shouldn't. I shouldn't be asking. I shouldn't be asking people to to uh, write the review for you, Jeff, because that's just lowering my chances of winning. <laughs> okay, write one for Lori as well. There you go. <laughs> All right, Debbie, you are up. All right, I am the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and you can find me online at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com and on Facebook, Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. And I'm HV Wine Goddess on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. And um, I really love this stuff. It's like I get off these type of programs, and it's like I don't know who I am. I'm like, where is everybody? <laughs> um, so thank you for inviting me. And um, if you're looking for um, Tapping the Hudson Valley, if you're going to visit the Hudson Valley anytime in the near future, go to tappingthehudsonvalley.com and you can uh, look in and purchase uh, my book. It's one and three day itineraries visiting the craft beverage producers and the sites along the way. And so. since Debbie does the calendar, when is our next episode? Of it's mo next Monday. It's next Monday. <laughs> next Monday. Next Monday, so, 8 o'clock is the 19th, right? Yeah. 12, yeah so, 12 and 7 is the 19th. Okay. So I need another snow day so I can work a little more. Yeah. <laughs> are we on um, Are we on J? We're we on J. Jakir. Jakir, I think it's how you Jack pronounce it. Yeah. Jakir. Right, Nick? Mm, yes. Did I say are, that right? Yeah. And I was still my favorite. So... Everybody, you like Itata? this is Nick. This is how we got Itata, thanks to Nick. Because I had sure. no clue what an I would be. And like, <laughs> boom, after an entire day of drinking at the Wine Bloggers Conference, he blew, he's like, I, Itata. Well, you're like, I said, well, what about ice wine? I'm not doing ice wine. I, know, I suggested that. Wine, let's. <laughs> well, because actually that starts with an E. Hey, not. <laughs> Come that's on. Federal you're no, that's ice, true. E-I-S-W-E. Yeah. Ice, sure. ice wine. But if you're in the States, ice wine. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I, I'm not going to lie. I've seen Finger yeah. Lakes I've seen <laughs> labels that have it I-C-E. So. Yeah, that's just for the U.S. market. Yes. Well, that's what, yeah. Well, they have <laughs> it in Canada, too, I think, that way, too, mm -hmm. in um, Ontario. Yeah. But just... I, I was so impressed after a day of drinking, bam, just like that. And I, of course, went home and we joked because I told Debbie, oh, Nick came up with Itata. It's Italy. 
<laughs> yeah, and I, and I, I Googled it. I'm like, Lori, it's Chile. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure it's Italy? Because I googled it and came up to LA. Come on, he's tired. Right. Sounds well, like it should be Italy. Hey, Lori, before <laughs> we before you give your last plug, you talked about glasses with Jeff. How many of you realized that I switched glasses mid podcast? But they're the same color. No. No. Oh. These are green. And these are brown. Oh, yeah. oh I only noticed Ooh. the green. Nobody noticed I went from these. Those are the these. only ones I noticed. Me too. <laughs> All right. So that That's could be it. a new game for us too, is how many glasses can we go through? <laughs> <laughs> And you got to define glasses. That is true. That is yeah. true. In this group, that is true. There we so, go. Anyway, I would like to thank There's you all for coming. And I am planning the next episode to be April 23rd. So if you can check into your calendars and see if that works for you. Um, and if you guys have suggestions of what topics you want to talk about, uh, I totally would appreciate it. And Jeff, if you can give me Google Hangout lessons, <laughs> I um, you know, uh, let me know but, when you have your next snow day. Okay, yeah. probably tomorrow. <laughs> okay, yeah. probably and, tomorrow. And, and Lori, I hate to say it, but if it wasn't, we weren't ending. I would be typing you a little chat. Okay, you're like you're doing a John thing. You're, you're, you, we now have lots of ceiling and very little uh, Lori. <laughs> yeah, kind of like, well, Jeff knows I bounce around a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> I kind of start to, to get down. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, thank you very much for joining. And I hope you all can come back on the 23rd. And please shoot me an email. Um, let me know what links you would like me to put on the homepage of if there's anything else other than your websites and your blogs or whatever that you would like. Um, but I totally appreciate talking to you and I had a blast. I hope you guys did too. I did so too. much fun. I did too. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Have a great evening. Cheers. Have a great night, guys. Good night. Cheers, everyone. Night. Bye. Bye.